than the evidence that we have and uh, leave you with some questions and how the future is uh, you know going to be um so uh, uh, at the very outset you know i also want uh, you know you people to focus on these two important quotes you know those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it and we can learn from history but we can also deceive ourselves when we selectively take evidence from the past to justify what we have already made up our minds to so i think both of them are very important especially with a topic uh, like neck dissection when i'll be talking about the history you know and uh, later on you will realize that why uh, why this is very important because what we were practicing or uh, you know where the history started and then we are probably going back to a stage there and then again you know going and changing our ideations from there on uh, so as most of you are youngsters i think you know uh, i i want to you know remember two people uh, two important teachers in my life you know who have uh, been you know instrumental in where i am today and uh, you know have uh, imbibed this passion in head and neck uh, for me one is my uh, pro- uh, you know teacher from my post graduation professor naresh panda and uh, during my fellowship training and a mentor later also probably a mentor for life uh, you know professor vishal rao uh so coming back to the main topic here uh, so the early 19th century this is like when you're talking about in 18000 you know what were the thoughts that were going on uh, in the mind of surgeons then so in 1847 maximilian joseph uh, you know uh, wrote that once the growth in the mouth has spread to the submaxillary gland so submaxillary gland is nothing but the submandibular gland or to any other structure complete removal of the disease is impossible uh, so look at this so when uh, the tumor has gone beyond the mouth you know reached the submandibular gland or spread to one of the lymph nodes the earlier idea was probably it is you know not worth treating it or it, you cannot be able to give a cure and this was because you know the moment a person has a metastasis a nodal metastasis his survival drops by 50% and if the node has any sort of extra nodal extension approximately another 50% drop in the outcomes and they also noted that uh, you know excision of just that simple lymph nodal metastasis was occasionally performed but had no benefit and you know often disastrous results so look um, what were the thoughts then so one is that you can't remove just the node that you that is you know uh, become big or positive uh, but then what were the limitations then you know then there was no general anesthesia which was available lack of aseptic techniques antibiotics were not there yet a lack of understanding of the cellular basis and the patterns of spread of these disease and the idea of you know that was still there the the need to excise the potential local disease also but to understand that they need to know where the how the tumor spreads and what are the patterns of spread uh in the second half of uh, 19th century you know things changed you know uh, langenbach theodor bilroth you know cocker they developed and reported on various types of neck dissection but uh, nothing gave in a comprehensive uh, may wherein you know which can be reproducible uh, so in 1885 the concept of elective neck dissection was uh, you know brought about by uh, sir butlin so when i say elective neck dissection and therapeutic neck dissection so elective neck dissection is when you you know in a patient who is not having a nodal metastasis you do a neck dissection that is called an elective neck dissection whereas a therapeutic neck dissection is something wherein the patient has a nodal metastasis and then you would have to do you are bound to do a neck dissection then in that case it becomes a therapeutic neck dissection and then there is another third part to it which is called a planned neck dissection so the planned neck dissection is usually done you know it was earlier done when the patients were given chemo rt first uh, chemo radiotherapy first and at a later date uh, uh you know asked to uh, after say about 8 weeks of completion of the treatment they underwent a neck dissection irrespective of the response of the nodes they underwent neck dissection so that was called a planned neck dissection so i think that these three terminologies are very clear here right at the outset because this will be you know i uh, will be repeating it again and again so the elective neck dissection what is the therapeutic neck dissection and the third one is a planned neck dissection so butlin's idea where the first breakthrough in the development of elective treatment for regional metastasis in head and neck cancers and this is very important because head and neck cancers generally tend to recur loco regionally and rarely they have you know recurrence at a distant site 
So most often, you know, so the best shot for treatment would be the best, you know, to give the right and the most appropriate treatment at the very first time itself. Uh, and then, you know, uh, probably uh, the first, you know, uh, robust description uh, came from a Polish surgeon, Jordan Ski, who reported on an operation wherein, you know, he removed the entire nodal, uh, you know, tissue along with the fibro fatty tissue. Uh, which was called a radical on block resection, but because this was published in a Polish journal, uh, you know, it never, uh, you know, reached the world. So uh, it, it remained, you know, uh, unnoticed for quite some time. And uh, this is somebody, uh, you know, um, in the early 20, uh, 20th century, that's the you know, start of the 1900s. You know, this is uh, George Washington trial. And uh, so Kreil uh, in 1905 actually first described uh, the unpublished, you know, his results of uh, the the radical neck dissection. It was uh, it was published in a surgical and gynecological journal, so it actually didn't you know get much uh, uh, you know popularity. So uh, then in 1906 this was published in JAMA, you know, and that's when you know the world recognized this. And Kreil recognized that cancer of the head and neck can head and neck, uh, you know, usually recurred predominantly in the cervical lymph nodes. And the thoughts then was, so whatever is below the mandible and above the clavicle up to the midline has to come out as a single structure. So that, so the collar of lymphatics of the neck form an extraordinary barrier through which cancer rarely penetrates. Every part of this barrier is surgically accessible. So anything below the mandible and above the clavicle and up to the midline and posterior or laterally up to the trapezius, anterior border of trapezius. So that had to come out, that entire, uh, you know, structure had to come out to, uh, and that, that actually gave the thoughts towards uh, uh, a radical neck dissection. Uh, so, um, a little later, uh, you know, this uh, gentleman, uh, Hayes Martin, uh, you know, uh, another uh, popular name that comes out in the head and neck. So, this is from the Memorial uh, Sloan, you know, that uh, Memorial Sloan catering that they developed the radical neck dissection. And uh, so, what they uh, suggested or uh, Hayes Martin and the team, you know, the group, they were of the opinion that, you know, any technique uh, because people elsewhere were trying to, you know, do surgeries which was lesser or uh, lesser than the radical neck dissection. So they completely condemned these. They said that any technique that is designed to preserve the spinal accessory nerve should be condemned unequivocally. So, uh, so there was a very strong, you know, thought of doing neck dissection and that's why the radical neck dissection and that's the reason why radical neck dissection has evolved to be the gold standard treatment for, you know, a nodal or a neck disease. Uh, then came, uh, but you know, people, the thoughts, you know, evolved, people continue to dry out more and more. And then there came the era of modified neck dissection. And um, why modified neck dissection? Because the morbidities that were associated with radical neck dissection, which we would probably discuss a little later, uh, were, you know, were too much, uh, you know, for patients to handle. So they were looking at, could we preserve certain structures to, you know, get, get the best outcome. So the main, one of the main structures was, you know, spinal accessory now. So in terms of the importance of structures, which are, you know, preserved. So you have the, at the upper, the topmost priority becomes the spinal accessory now. The second becomes the internal jugular vein and the third becomes the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the order of, you know, which one is more important to be preserved. And uh, so Oswald Suarez developed in 1952 a functional neck dissection. So mind you, a functional neck dissection is not equivalent to a modified radical neck dissection type 3 wherein you preserve all the three structures. So there is a slight difference between what is a functional neck dissection. So I believe most of you are from the ENT background and uh, you would know who, so what is FES. So FES is functional and endoscopic sinus surgery. So if you go back to the same thoughts of FES, so you don't go anything radical, but you just do enough, you know, to clear off or, you know, the, the clear off the uh, ostia, whatever is, you know, obstructing there so that the drainage continues yet preserving the adequate mucosa. 
So similarly, the functional necrosection here was to preserve the functions of the neck. So that included preserving the submandibular gland, homoid muscle, and all of it. So that gave a concept of functional neck dissection. So in its true sense, functional neck dissection is not actually a modified radical neck dissection type 3. So, uh, so what is this? So, as I as I told you, a technique that you know completely eliminates the lymph nodal tissue in the neck along with the primary tumor while carefully preserving the noble structures such as sternocleidomastoid muscle, the homoid muscle, the submandibular gland, the internal jugular vein, and occasionally the spinal accessory nerve. You know, but again, uh, you know, uh, uh, Suarez's work was later popularized by Boca and uh, Gavilan. You know, who further and proposed a less aggressive surgery, which would probably get the same results that uh, you would, uh, you know, get from a radical neck dissection. So, and from there on, from modified radical, from modified radical neck dissection, we moved to, a, you know, thoughts in the 1960s when surgeons at the MD Anderson, you know, start, uh, you know, looking at if selectively they could remove lymph nodal groups and see what are the outcomes. And that's why, the thought of you know concept of selective uh, neck dissections came in wherein you looked at targeting only selective lymph nodal groups that are at the highest risk of metastasis. Uh, so coming to uh, the, the lymph nodal group, so uh, basically uh, the classification was given by uh, Katie Robbins, you know, uh, the Robbins and Cotton, the, the book that we have in pathology, so the same Robbins had uh, you know uh, given this classification when he was one of the key authors uh, to the lymph nodal staging but here we'll be discussing only about you know mainly level uh, 1 to 5 uh, but uh, technically speaking there are over 10 uh, levels of uh, you know neck nodes so these includes the waldeyer's node and uh, you know the waldeyer's ring and the nodes around that so it goes up beyond 10 but for you know our uh, you know general day to day practice the most important ones are level 1 to 5 and occasionally level 6 so the anatomical boundaries of each level may not be the same as a radiological boundary. So there are slight differences between what will be the radiological boundary and what is the anat true anatomical boundary. Uh, so the important, so the level one is divided into uh, level 1A and 1B. So level 1A is between the two bellies, anterior bellies of the digastric and lower down formed by the hyoid becomes the lower margin. So that angular space becomes level 1A, which is also called as a submental, uh, you know, level. Submandibular level is again formed by the anterior border of the digastric. As you can see here, uh, the anterior border of uh, the digastric here, uh, the lower border of the mandible and the stylohyoid muscle. So the stylohyoid muscle here is the posterior limit of the level one, level one B, and not the posterior belly of digastric. Um, I, I further down, you know, I'll show it to you in the pictures the difference between stylohyoid and the posterior belly of digastric. And uh, you know, radiologically, it is very difficult to make out the posterior belly of digastric or the uh, stylohyoid muscle. So that's why the posterior border of submandibular gland is considered as the radiological limit of level 1B posteriorly. Uh, what is formed by level 2? So level 2 is again formed by the, you know, stylohyoid muscle. Uh, at, at the top, it forms, uh, you know, an apex, uh, you know, between the uh, attachments to the styloid process and the mastoid process, uh, you know, the sternocleidomastoid, uh, you know, uh, attaches the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid and lower down the lower limit being defined by the hyoid bone, which is corresponding here. Uh, level three uh, is, you know, from the same, so the lower border of hyoid, medially, it is the lateral border of the stylohyoid muscle, the strap muscles, uh, anatomically, and the lower board and the lower limit is the lower border of the tricot cartilage level but radiologically the the medial margin of these again the strap muscles may not be very accurately made so it is the medial border of the common carotid artery which is usually considered as the radiological limit medial limit of the uh, you know the neck level there so level 4 is the lower level of the clavicle and you know above superiorly at the lower border of the cricoid level 2 again is divided into level 2A and 2B. So 2A is what lies medial or inferior to the spinal accessory nerve. 
So spinal accessory nerve comes from the jugular foramen, the pars nervosa, and runs downwards towards uh, you know uh, the the sternocleidomastoid pierces the sternocleidomastoid passes through the substance and then comes out and traverses into level 5 so the boundaries of level 5 is the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid anteriorly posteriorly the anterior border of the trapezius and inferiorly the clavicle so again level 5 is further divided into level 5a and 5b uh, there were there were you know concerns or differences where people thought it is the omohyoid which divides it into level 5a 5b some thought that it is spinal accessory nerve but ideally it is the cricoid the lower border of cricoid uh, which again divides 5a into 5 uh, you know level 5 into 5a and 5b and 5a accommodates the spinal accessory nerve here uh, so now that we have understood the levels of uh, you know the neck and what is the likely um, sites of metastasis for you know head and neck cancer uh, there is some uh, very interesting work you know by robert lindberg which was probably one of the most landmark you know papers that that came, came out then you know so he studied uh, in about 2000 odd patients uh, who were untreated you know of squamous cell carcinoma of head and neck to look at what were the patterns of lymph nodal spread in these tumors i mean with individual primary sites so this was very important because that's when the thoughts you know of doing a selective neck decision selectively removing groups of lymph nodes was getting popular so when both of these came together what evolved was very significant uh, so again he classified the lymph nodal groups what we discussed here and uh, level 2 is also called as the jugular digastric node so as the name suggests the jugular because all these lymphatics run along the jugular vein and the digastric because the digastric muscle you know looks at uh, which is almost corresponding to styloid forms the anterior border of level uh, 2. So here you can see you know the pattern of spread so the retromolar trigon and uh, you know the anterior fossil pillars see the most likely site of metastasis here you know uh, that is level 1b and level 2 and level 3. Similarly, of soft palate, you can see again level 2 and level 3. Of oral tongue, it is more likely in the level 1A, more 1B, and then, you know, even to level 2. The tonsillar fossa similarly to level, you know, 2, uh, which is more likely in level 3. So, he looked at uh, about 7 to 9 such, you know, different subsites to identify different, you know, patterns of lymph nodal spread and what are the percentages. And this was very important to you know for the further evolution of the practices of neck dissection uh, but but when 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 should you ideally do a neck dissection so what were the so what how did somebody you know come to a conclusion as to when should i do a neck or uh, you know or, or is there something which can be defined so this was based on a, a simple mathematical calculation and uh, you know so here if you see uh, the the probability of occult metastasis and expected utt this was a paper by vice so they concluded that whenever there is a chance of you, know, you can see the two lines you know intersect at 20% so whenever there is a chance of 20% or more risk of occult metastasis it is always beneficial to do a neck dissection Less than that, you know, there is no significant benefit. So, but here, if you see, you see the moment you see your, your your expected utility suddenly, you know, increases. Uh, then uh, this was, um, you know, Jesus Medina, uh, you know, another, uh, you know, prominent figure. And uh, why I brought this up is uh, these are usual questions in the, you know, ENT rounds or the ward rounds where they ask you, okay, tell me the classifications of uh, neck dissection. And then you would say, okay, Medina's classification without knowing who is, who is this Medina or what is academy, academy, what academy had given this classification. So it was Jesus Medina who, you know, put in the first efforts to actually give a rational classification of this neck dissection because there are a lot of terminologies and if something has to be something has to become more popular and reproducible and you want to know the results, then there has to be uniformity across, you know, practices. So again, you know, neck nodal levels. Uh, so he classified neck dissections into three types, basically. So comprehensive neck dissections, so as the name suggests, comprehensive. So that when you say comprehensive, that's the entire thing. So entire levels are removed. So mainly level one to five. So these include the radical neck dissection, the modified radical neck dissection. So modified radical neck dissection type one, two, and three. 
depending on the number of structures and the most important structure preserved. So when only spinal accessory nerve is preserved, it's type one. When it's spinal accessory nerve and internal jugular vein or two important structures are preserved, it becomes, uh, you know, type two. And when all three are preserved, it becomes, uh, you know, type three neck dissection. But what are the structures which are removed in the neck dissection, in a comprehensive neck dissection? So ideally by description, so it includes, uh, you know, the, the fibro fatty tissue in the neck from level 1A to 5, along with submandibular gland, the tail of the parotid, because the tail of the parotid is considered as a part of the neck. And, you know, the initial thoughts were that there are nodes there. So that's why the idea of clearing that along with omohaired muscle that became the, you know, uh, the, the, the comprehensive neck dissection. Uh, and depending if the spinal accessory nerve, you know, the internal jugular vein and sternocleidomastoid muscle is removed, then it becomes a radical neck dissection. Then there are selective neck dissections, so selective as the name, you know, goes. So you select only a select group of lymph nodes and not everything. So when I say lateral, lateral neck nodes are level 2, 3 and 4. Posterior lateral group, the posterior group is level 5. So when I say posterior lateral, it becomes, you know, level 2 to 5. Anterolateral is uh, the supraomoid neck dissection, which includes level one to level four. And then there is extended neck dissection. So whenever the radical neck dissection or the comprehensive neck dissection includes or the selective neck dissection includes a structure which is not routinely uh, removed during a neck dissection, say, for example, the skin uh, is removed or, uh, you know, the entire part of the parotid is removed or some issue which is removed, then it becomes something called as an extended neck dissection. But again, this had a lot of ambiguity. Uh, so that's when you know, American Academy decided to step in and this is where the Academy's classification came in. So the Academy's classification, uh, you know, basically in 1991 uh, defined this into, you know, four types. So the radical neck dissection, modified radical neck dissection, the selective neck dissection and the extended neck dissection. But then in 2001, they, they you know, realized that uh, probably the selective neck dissection, the, the terminology supraomoid, lateral, posterior lateral, anterior was getting more and more confusing. So then they decided to change it to selective neck dissection, wherein each variation is depicted by SND. And in parenthesis, you denote the levels or sublevels that have been removed. Right. So this became the, the more acceptable and the pop, popular classification. And in 2008 on, you know, there were some modifications where they also suggest, you know, adding the structures which have been preserved additionally. So coming back to the, the main concept of neck dissection. So as I told you, the initial thoughts were everything from below the mandible to above the clavicle from midline to posteriorly the anterior border of trapezius, all the tissues have to come in. So this tissue is basically, you know, in, uh, engulfed within the investing the layer of deep uh, in deep cervical fascia so the investing layer and the prevertebral fascia of uh, the layer of the deep cervical fascia so between that the entire structures had to come out so the only important structure you know which you can you cannot remove without compromising the life of the patient is the carotid artery and that is why that was left behind and that's why they decided to remove everything else that came in the way and that's why the concept of radical neck dissection came in So as I told you, so in this axial section, you can see, so these are the strap muscles here and the strap muscle, this would be the lateral border of, you know, your, uh, the, the medial border of your neck dissection currently. This is the sternocleidomastoid and, and this is the investing layer of deep cervical fascia, the carotid sheath here and the prevertebral fascia. So whatever tissue, you know, is there here in this space is basically removed in what is called as the neck dissection. So that's the fibro fatty tissue. So there are lymph nodes that run along the venous channels uh, and the internal jugular vein. So these are encapsulated within the fibro fatty tissue there and taking it out end block uh, was the initial concept. But as you know, uh, science evolved and we had more and more evidence. They realized that end block resection or per level resection, the, the differences in outcomes have not been very significant, uh, provided you do a good job and you you know, do the adequate clearances. Uh, again, another picture depicting the, the basic idea of neck dissection here. So, you know, the, the blue tissue that you can see here. 
so whatever is within this you know that has to come out in a modified radical negative section so uh, if you additionally remove internal jugular vein and the synovioclidomastoid muscle along with the nerve it becomes a radical neck dissection um another important uh, you know uh, uh, thing is uh, the the uh, the spinal axillary nerve so this is the, the probably the currently the most of the you know structures which are at risk the most important structure to be preserved uh the reason why i tell you is when you see a patient you know after you have done so the preservation of spinal accessory should not just be anatomical but it should be functional as well so when the spinal accessory nerve you know uh, is injured or there is a uh, damage to the spinal accessory nerve so there is something the patient develops called shoulder syndrome which you know adds to a lot of morbidity in these patients so understanding the relationship of the spinal accessory nerve with the other critical structure that is the internal jugular vein is very important so this runs under uh, you know from the pars nervosa which is the anterior part of the jugular foramen and the jugular uh, you know the, the internal jugular vein from the sigmoid sinus when it forms the internal jugular vein so that arises from the pars venosa which is the posterior part so the anterior nervous and the posterior so the most likely relationship is that the nerve lies in front of the vein but occasionally there are variations wherein the nerve can come from behind the the vein that is 3% and about 1% where it comes through the vein so it pierces the vein and comes out so why you need to be careful here is say a lot of times you know you would have a node sitting right across and if you are able to trace the spinal accessory nerve and the nerve and the node is over the spinal accessory nerve you are pretty sure that you are, you know if you can trace along the spinal accessory nerve you would be safe and will, will not be injuring the internal jugular vein higher up in the submuscular recess or the level 2b um so again uh, demonstrating the same thing uh, with a surgical picture you know here uh, so you can see the patient position here just to show you so this is the anterior belly of digastric on the right side so similarly you have something on the left side and this marks the level 1a here this you know the under the lower border of mandible and here the the whitish structure that you can see is actually the, this the posterior belly of digastric and what i have marked below the reddish structure that is the stylohyoid so stylohyoid forms the posterior border of the anatomically the submandibular uh, space or uh, the submandibular uh, level level 1b so this level is level 1b coming to the next picture here you know uh, the same uh, patient uh, from a different a different patient in fact from different angle so here the only the posterior belly of digastric is preserved the styloid is not very clear so here you can see from the hyoid bone uh, you know to the apex and the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid and lower the imaginary line at the level of hyoid bone so this forms the level 2 and what you can see here the structure that is running here is the spinal accessory nerve and i told you see higher up it is like going in front of the internal jugular vein so where my cursor is at the internal jugular vein here it is going in front of it so this area is level 2b it is also called as submuscular recess and this is level 2a what is marked below is level 3 so again you know the anterior border of uh, the lateral border of the strap muscles uh, which is the sterno uh, hyoid muscle here posterior belly of uh, the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle and inferiorly the lower border of cricoid cartilage uh level 4 again you know the lower border of clavicle here and uh, superiorly the cricoid and the borders remain the same you know the posterior border of uh, the sternocleidomastoid here and this is level 5 so here uh, you know this is a case of this is a type uh, you know type 2 uh, uh, modified radical neck dissection where the internal jugular vein and uh, you know the spinal accessory nerve has been preserved so here you can see uh, so what is level 5 so here this roughly would correspond to the posterior border of the uh, the, the sternocleidomastoid muscle and here you know representing the anterior border of the trapezius muscle here so you can see very clearly that the stern the spinal accessory nerve is running under the trapezius muscle here and this now is this above the lower border of cricoid cartilage so this is level 5a and this becomes level 5b below 
Um, so this is uh, the picture of a radical neck dissection. So here you can see very well, you know, so we have here, you know, even removed the digastric here to give you a very you know, much clearer picture here. So this is the common carotid artery, the carotid bulb here, and this is the internal carotid artery, which is taking a bulb. You know, so sometimes you get it as a knuckle and, uh, you know, later on I'll tell you. So we have written on this also the importance of, you know, palpation of level 2B. Uh, or level two before you actually start dissecting in that area. And here you can see the hypoglossal nerve that is coming here, right? And uh, uh, this, uh, so all the structures so of the submandibular gland has been removed. The, this is the parotid gland and, you know, part of the parotid tail has also been removed. So this is how a radical neck dissection in the field would look at the end of the surgery. Uh, so as I told you, this the most uh, you know important uh, you know structure uh, preservation uh, you know functional wise has been the spinal accessory nerve you know and uh, the most you know crucial or the important landmarks which have been mentioned in your textbook has been the herbs point and herbs point is the point where the uh, you know the great auricular nerve the c2 c3 division actually winds around the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid and a centimeter approximately about 11 millimeters from that is uh, where your uh, you know this posterior uh, the, the spinal accessory uh, nerve in level 5 emerges so that that is a distance here but uh, apart from these there are some other you know important landmarks which have been defined and that's why i want to talk about these so uh, what are the other you know, landmarks that, you know, a surgeon can depend upon, say, okay, you have by chance, you know, cut this great auricular nerve, what are the other options that you are left with? So then, you know, the options are, the other landmark is roughly between the, you know, upper one third and lower two third. That's a junction, you know, where you would see the spinal accessory nerve emerging posteriorly. The other is, you know, the lateral force of C2 vertebra. That is another, you know, important landmark which should come up here, you know, in level two to identify the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, apart from this, there is another uh, vein, you know, popularly uh, called as Chaukar's vein, uh, which is again, you know, in level uh, four, uh, sorry, level two, there are some veins uh, which, you know, uh, drain into the pharyngeal plexus. So these tiny veins, uh, you know, they have defined these, uh, these are a rather a constant landmark and about uh, a few millimeters from them below would be the spinal accessory nerve, uh, nerve in level two. And... Uh, to best preserve, uh, you know, uh, these, you know, the, the vascularity of the nerve additionally has to be, uh, you know, preserved apart from the traction injuries which happen. There's another, uh, you know, interesting paper which we had, uh, we have, um, it's called the X-pointer. This is, you know, probably the most recent of the landmarks. It was uh, earlier, uh, you know, defined uh, early in history. It was called, uh, you know, a cross, but uh, later uh, we studied this and we found it to be a constant landmark, you know, irrespective of the body stature, uh, you know, and this could be a very, you know, another additional tool which, uh, you know, a beginner surgeon can use to be sure that, you know, he doesn't injure the spinal accessory nerve. So this is basically the, the relation at the posterior border, wherein the great auricular nerve and the spinal accessory nerve, so there you can see it crosses over and it forms an X. So what you see here, A and D are the, you know, the cervical rootlets and this is the great auricular nerve, A. And C is the spinal accessory nerve here. So you can see that there's a crossover that happens and this crossover is a constant relationship and we have termed it as the X pointer. So uh, the other paper which is talking about, you know, Dr. Chaukar and Chaukar's vein, uh, this is the pharyngeal, uh, you know, uh, the vein that runs uh, from uh, lateral to medial to the pharyngeal plexus and just below that would be the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, in terms of the preservation, you know, to clear that level to be the fat that is there here, the nerve is put under undue traction to, you know, get adequate exposure. Uh, in my internal audits and, you know, my surgical practice, what I have learned and I've been doing is, uh, though, you know, you often tend to, you know, miss these steps and, you know, all look at probably injuring the nerve sometimes, but you know, what I've been trying to do is, you know, preserve, there are some, you know, small veins that run along it, try to preserve those veins and not to put the nerve under undue traction. So, you know, if you can uh, give some addition, additional traction to this level 2B area, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and just be a little careful, you know, you need not run by the clock here, you know, you can spend some time 
and that would come in a long way to you know preserving the shoulder functions of a patient here uh, beyond this uh, what uh, remains important is the incision planning you know uh, for neck dissection the exposure is the key you know to do a good uh, neck dissection and to achieve good clearance you need to have a good exposure so i think the different types of incisions have been you know very well described in your textbooks uh, you know stell and maran or cummings that you can you know go back uh, to uh, read um, they have uh, defined all the incisions and described it so these include the schobinger's incision the modified schobinger trial uh, you know the macfee incision the utility lateral utility uh, incision the horiba sophistic incision and the most popular now the the transverse uh, you know skin crease incision so understanding the concept so how would you define how would you plan a incision so remember often your incision uh, for the access to the oral cavity or the oropharynx or the larynx you know has to be accommodated within the neck incision so understanding the you know vascularity of the neck uh, when you are uh, is very important so as you can see there are you know vessels that supply from below from above below the mandible and from posteriorly so when you are planning an incision the incision has to be such that you don't cut to the vascularity or else you know your flap would uh, you know be compromised your neck flap um so this is uh, another you know a transverse cervical incision uh, through which you have done a you know complete neck dissection um, here uh, so this is a sternocleidomastoid that has also been retracted actually uh, the it's not very clear here but uh, if you go laterally you have the lateral border of uh, you know the the anterior border of trapezius also which is defined and you can see the spinal accessory now so with a you know a very neck incision itself a transverse incision you can also look at doing a complete uh, you know modified radical neck dissection as well uh coming back to you know the uh, the first quote which i actually mentioned that if you don't know what was history you are doomed to repeat itself and uh, you know you go wrong so this is something probably during in our times you know the most important or the landmark paper that has come out you know which is elective uh, versus therapeutic neck dissection in non negative oral cancer from india you know professor dikruz and team from tata actually have come up with this uh, study you know a brilliant study it's only randomized control trial uh, back then uh, but uh, i want you to you know go back probably two decades from when they published this data and to see you know how the thoughts evolved so probably the first uh, randomized control trial then was done by fucky et al from you know uh, tata itself wherein they looked at doing a hemiglossectomy along with radical neck dissection so there they found that you know initial thoughts were that under 4 mm depth of invasion if you do a neck dissection uh, you know uh, doesn't really benefit the patient so and after this you know uh, when the thoughts evolved in the same institute you know they did a retrospective study and in the retrospective study again they found in the retrospective data that you know neck observation that is a therapeutic neck dissection when a patient develops a neck node is good enough but then you know something was bothering and then they decided to do a randomized control trial and when they did this randomized control trials there was a flip you know total flip of the results you know so then they realized that doing an elective neck dissection in a patient who is clinically node negative uh, which was evaluated by clinical examination and ultrasound so clinical examination by palpation has about 70 60 to 70% sensitivity to detecting a neck node so there they found that you know doing an elective neck dissection gave a survival advantage of about 12.5% so those who those necks you know which were node negative on ultrasound as well as on clinical examination they were observed so these patients recurred more and those recurrences when you know uh, came back they were less likely to be salvageable as well so doing a simple neck dissection at that time so they did only a level 1 to 3 neck dissection which is you know your supramohyoid neck dissection which was good enough and gave a survival advantage of 12.5% so that's a huge you know huge impact and then you know this followed and you know then uh, there was lot of interest which came up uh, you know uh, elsewhere in the world um, so the other study which was probably uh, you know came in recently is the sent sent trial or the sent study from uk it's a multi institution study where they looked at two parts uh, 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 observational arm and a randomized control trial both of which and both of them you know resonating the same results as to what the paper from uh, you know the dicruz et al it's called the mumbai trial uh, came out you know or the n0 uh, n0 trial uh, uh, data that 
doing an elective neck dissection has a survival advantage and and this is where i want to emphasize on you know all uh, you know all my younger colleagues and you know even to the senior ones also so the depth of invasion is something which you cannot actually assess clinically so mind you even when you say depth of invasion can be assessed in the oral tongue and buccal mucosa you cannot actually measure it. these are the only two sites wherein you can use a bimanual palpation to identify that that and what you re- understand or what you can palpate is actually the tumor thickness and not essentially the depth of invasion and all these studies have said you know under 3 mm you may look at observing the neck and what how how are you able to make out the difference but is it 3 mm or 4 mm and giving the patient the benefit of doubt you know always has a survival advantage for him so any uh, you know uh, oral malignancy a uh, elective neck dissection however superficial the disease is an elective neck dissection is always going to be advantages and i'll tell you further you know why and uh, again a lot that we have written and you know uh, you know created ideations to etc and we have also published data on that as to why this is you know important so now what is what if so now we've discussed that in an n0 neck the the supraumoid neck dissection or level 1 to 3 is good enough you know and uh, that gives a survival a definitive survival advantage to the patient but what if a patient is you know n plus neck so what is the minimum surgery so the gold standard as i told you is been radical neck dissection because for you know several over half a decade or more we were you know engraved to believe that radical neck dissection was more superior but you know this uh, this is the largest prospective study that we have again from tata uh, you know wherein 583 patients where they mapped that you know the patterns of uh, where all the metastasis happens and they found out that you know most often uh, you know the metastasis occurred from level 1 to 5 and very rarely in level 5 so the percentage of metastasis to level 2b and 5 were 3.8% and 3.3% and what they also you know predicted that presence of level 2a positive is a 2a if there is a node then there is a high likelihood that there is a metastasis in both level 2b and level 5 so as per you know this study in a low nodal burden disease even a selective neck dissection that is doing from level 1 to 4 is good enough and gives similar you know survival and and i think probably in future you know near future when if we can have a randomized control trial or you know more data is built up on this probably for an n plus neck also we would be looking at doing a selective neck dissection itself because when you dissect the entire course of uh, spinal accessory nerve in level 5 you know that uh den- the denervation or devascularization of the nerve is likely and that results in shoulder syndrome so when there is a very low risk of metastasis to level 5 probably you know we can look at you know skipping that level and see uh, the other aspect is that if a patient is n plus you know most likely if it's a large node or in n1 n1 or an n2 kind of a disease the patient is likely to receive you know radiation for sure and those fields can be covered when you have such very low factor of low chance but whenever but always surgically removing a level is always better than electively irradiating the neck um so this is another uh, you know important area so a lot of people talk about you know omitting level 2b because the chances of nodal metastasis is quite less and this is something which i have been very touchy upon you know uh, uh because probably uh, uh, you know in clinical experiences also in my own experience i've seen when you leave level 2b and the patient uh, recurs in level 2b it's unlikely that you're going to you'll be in a position to salvage it so as well you know spend some time there and clear level 2b and why i'm telling you this is uh, this is another uh, you know paper uh, which we had written a short uh, commentary uh, where the omission of level 2b in early oral cancer and why we need to be cautious because a lot of studies you know actually have not divided in the numerator here you know have uh, they have uh, they have uh, included the total number of neck dissections rather than the total number of patients so imagine in a patient you have done uh, who's a lateral tongue you know just about crossing midline and then you do the opposite neck dissection also very unlikely that there will be metastasis on the opposite side and when you divide the total number of nodes in level 2b with the total number of neck dissections which have been done the percentage is going to be quite low so here what is marked a are where the denominator has been the number of neck dissections there you can see actually the percentage has been you know lower whereas on the other side it's been you know much higher that so 
acha i feel you know probably uh, you know spending some time and trying to you know meticulously dissect around the spinal accessory nerve and clearing level to be is uh, you know a lot better because a recurrence there is like unlikely to be salvageable um so another paper which is talking about you know that intraoperative level 2 palpation uh, before neck dissection so this is for all youngsters you know uh, overzealously running your cautery or your knife uh, or your knife or the scissor sharps instruments there you know uh, it's always worthwhile to spend a minute just to see palpate if there is any pulsations there because elderly people have a carotid knuckle and even some of the youngsters we have seen a prominent carotid knuckle that just appears like a node and if you overzealously or over enthusiastically just try to take out that it will result in disastrous uh, you know consequences so always you know spending some time to palpate the level 2 before going ahead with the neck dissection is definitely a safe practice and i think all youngsters should practice this and the other one is the preservation of spinal accessory nerve in level 2b as i told you, you know something which uh, is a little i am a little touchy about you know is level 2b and uh, i in my personal practice and i would not advocate you know unless i am i have convincing data or evidence to suggest that we can look at sparing level 2b and the most important thing you know why is elective neck dissection probably giving an advantage in a patient who is clinically n0 and this we have also done in a study wherein you know we have looked at even evaluating these patients with pet ct and seeing if you know in a pet ct pet negative disease also are we, so pet is considered a little more superior to the ultrasound here so when we have used the pet do we see the same advantage with doing an elective neck dissection and yes we have we haven't been able to publish that data as yet you know but uh, there also we have seen you know similar uh, you know outcomes and the reason could be you know probably micro metastasis in isolated tumor cells which are not you know picked up in the usual pathology sectioning unless you specifically ask for it or it is a center which is you know likely uh, looking at a large volume oncology center where you know there are dedicated onco pathologists unlike likely that this is going to be missed and that could be one of the reasons you know wherein you clear the neck electively these micrometastases and isolated tumor cells are cleared and that's why you know it has a better uh, advantage than just neck observation as this has been you know shown by uh, several randomized control trials uh, and i think the debate has to end here probably you know i still see a lot of people still keep on debating that in an n0 neck should we do a neck dissection or not i think it's done and dusted we elective neck dissection irrespective of the tumor thickness or the depth of invasion which we cannot predict clinically preoperatively you know i i strongly advocate an elective neck dissection has to be done in each case and uh, you know another um, you know a uh, short uh, ideation to leave you with you know is supraomohyoid neck dissection uh, for clinically node negative uh, uh, oral cavity carcinomas is this time to change practices you know because still lot of people you know still look at uh, going to level 4 and clearing it giving an additional advantage but if you actually look at the chances of level 4 metastasis and lot of people quote the chance of skip metastasis of tongue Uh, in fact and they quote the paper by buyer uh, et al and uh, the paper actually looked at uh, patients who were previously treated who had undergone a supraomohyoid neck dissection and that's why the risk of you know skip metastasis was pretty high in that paper but in fact the uh, other paper uh, which which came in uh, you know recently a uh, uh, meta analysis showed that the chances of skip metastasis to level 4 is uh, extremely less you know it's under uh, i think 3% uh going one step further you know about the technique incision planning we have also you know thoughts of uh, doing it giving a much more cosmetically pleasing uh, result so there we have looked at the retro ocular approach and there's this paper uh, which we have written on the approach to uh, you know this neck dissection and what are the, the basically it's a description of a surgical technique uh, to give you a you know guide as to how you can uh, do a retro ocular approach uh, to uh, but mind you you know uh, at the starting phase of your career it's probably most important is the exposure and once you are pretty confident with doing a neck only then venture into this space and uh, lastly leaving with some other thoughts you know again uh, circulating tumor cells in head and neck cancers and uh, you know this is another reason probably why we should look at doing an elective neck dissection also so circulating tumor cells may not just be in the you know the blood vessels it may be in the lymphatics as well and that's why probably we should you know advocate an elective neck dissection in uh, a oral cavity malignancy or any head and neck uh, cancer uh, which is treated surgically 
uh and uh, so what are the future so what is uh, what are we uh, going to look at so the future with the discussion would probably be towards uh, you know doing a super selective neck dissection so this would include you know just not doing level 1 2 3 but you know just a selective levels and you know one level above and one level below that to get adequate clearance sentinel nodes you know uh, there's another trial it's called the sent SENT trial you know again from europe uh, which is again you know uh, created lot of you know interest in sentinel nodes right now it's not been a popular technique but you know uh, you never know in the times to come sentinel nodes may become uh, sentinel node biopsy may become you know a rational option like how it has become in breast cancer and uh, finally molecular techniques you know marking to see if you know a patient is likely to have a metastasis these are where i think the future is um, headed to uh and so basically i have uh, you know uh, figured out my uh, mainly from stellan maran and the textbooks that i suggest you know all of you to read is stellan maran it's a wonderful book i mean if you want to take a little deeper dive then probably cummings is a wonderful book you know uh, to read about uh, neck dissection uh, and the oral, oral part of head and neck cancers and there are some basic articles from which i have taken about the history and the internet and uh, i'd like to conclude that in the absence of information we jump to the worst conclusion so please mind you that this was just a you know small ideation to you know tell you look at give you some put in some thoughts into your brains you know pick your brain so that you can go back and start reading more to understand these concepts and uh, you know become a little more clearer so thank you and uh, you know any of you who are interested to discuss further or learn more you know always can reach out to me in person uh, we'd we'll be more than happy to help thanks thank you sir for a super le superb lecture i hope the postgraduates had a really lovely session so i uh, will open up uh, the uh, q and a sessions for the audience so any audience who wish to um, interact with the speaker can unmute or else uh, you can post in the chat section i will uh, read out so one question was posted in the initial part uh, sir can you uh, can you take the question sir yeah so uh, that's uh, if i'm right uh, what divides level 5 into 2 yes, yes. So, so level five. Uh, so different descriptions are there. You know, some people say that it is spinal accessory now. Some, you know, omohead. But it is the lower border of cricoid. You know, if you draw and draw an imaginary line from the lower border of cricoid laterally, so that would divide the level five into level five A and five B. And level five A is where the spinal accessory nerve, the course of spinal accessory nerve, is entirely in level five A and not in level five B. Uh, so the audience can unmute and uh, interact with the speaker. We'll be taking a uh, few questions. Uh, Dr. Anand, this is Dr. Sudarshan Reddy, Professor HOD, Usman Medical College, Government ENT Hospital, Hyderabad. Uh, it was an excellent, excellent uh, presentation, and uh, you have given uh, in brief, but uh, in total, about the anatomy, surgical anatomy of the neck and the neck dissections. Uh, my question is, what is the role of uh, neck dissection post uh, radiotherapy? Uh, so, uh, so, given so, radiotherapy, but uh, again, the patient has the uh, neck nodes. Uh, sir, so uh, this was uh, the concept of something called as planned neck dissection, which I had mentioned earlier. So, uh, when the organ preservation protocols came in, wherein uh, the laryngeal and oropharyngeal cancers were, uh, you know, starting to be treated non-surgically, uh, basically with chemo radiotherapy, the neck was not addressed then. 
but you know patients who had large nodal disease say an n2 or n3 node unlikely that it is going to completely respond to rt uh, or chemo rt for that matter so these patients at the end, you know earlier practice was to you know go ahead and do a planned neck dissection so the planned neck dissection uh, was done uh, about 8 weeks after the completion of chemo rt where they did a radical neck dissection or a modified radical neck dissection depending on the the node of it but they also noticed that only about 30% of you know even in patients who had an fnac which said that likely to be you know residual tissue residual metastatic cells uh, they found only about 30% of actually patients you know had true uh, you know uh, you know live cells or you know metastatic disease so and then later in 2016 a paper came up the petnec trial and uh, with you know pet becoming more popular wherein you can monitor the role of you know, the the recurrences in the neck uh, after treatment completion of treatment uh, now the current uh, you know stand is that you don't have to do a planned neck uh, if if it's possible it is always best to do a radical dissection in large bird and nodal disease early and then send the patient for rt okay thank you <clears throat> any more questions from the audience Uh, so I think I can see a question: How we decide type one, type two, and type three? Uh, uh, see, uh, so basically, type one is where you can preserve the spinal accessory nerve. So, say, imagine a situation wherein you have, uh, you know, a level three node which is stuck to the internal jugular vein and partly to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So, when there is an extra nodal extension, so in this case, you know, you can look at preserving the spinal accessory nerve. So, I've shown you one particular, you know, case wherein we had preserved the internal jugular vein and the spinal accessory nerve and taken off the sternocleidomastoid. So, when you are putting a pedicle flap like a PMMC uh, onto the neck, you know, to reduce the neck bulk, also a lot of people, you know, even though the sternocleidomastoid is fine, take a look at removing the sternocleidomastoid. uh so basically type 1 is when you know that the nerve is not involved or you know is not entrapped within the node uh type 2 uh, where you can preserve two structures as i told you uh, that is uh, you know when there is a node which is having extra nodal extension to level uh, uh, to the uh, uh, you know to the sternocleidomastoid there is some addition then it's always best to remove the sternocleidomastoid muscle and type 3 uh wherein you preserve all the three structures which is uh you know uh when you have an n1 disease where there is no extra capsule or very minimal extra capsular extension you can look at doing a uh, whenever you know you can have a plane around the internal jugular vein and the sub uh, the, the the sternocleidomastoid muscle or the spinal accessory nerve that's when you can look at doing a functional neck dissection or a type 3 mrnd so i think uh, we can conclude uh, the uh, this the final question what type of neck dissection do you plan when uh, spinal accessory nerve is alone involved uh, uh see uh, again uh, as i told you see these are nomenclature so probably the best nomenclature is when only one structure is preserved then it is you know type 1 when two structures are preserved it's type 2 when three structures is preserved it's type 3 i think that reduces the ambiguity here so uh, in a situation you know wherein the spinal accessory nerve is alone involved unlikely that you know the node uh, is you will be able to more most often you know the node would be also adherent to the internal jugular vein or to the sub spinal to the sternocleidomastoid muscle right so uh, so you know very rarely you would get a scenario wherein you would you know take off the spinal accessory nerve Uh, are leaving behind the internal jugular vein and the sternocleidomastoid muscle 
so uh, the most important structure you know uh, uh, here is uh, the uh, based on the from above downwards you know so uh, spinal accessory nerve is the most important thing because uh, you know the the chances of the shoulder syndrome and the morbidities are higher the second most important structure is the internal jugular vein and third the sternocleidomastoid muscle because the moment you remove the sternocleidomastoid muscle the uh, the the carotid is directly under the skin flap you know and uh, so any injury there can so the sternocleidomastoid preserving there you know gives a additional cover to the carotid uh, vessel there so any specific bit which you can advise for mc head and neck entrance exam apart from stellen maren okay uh, so uh, that's a that's a tough question i think uh, um, with the current i am really not sure what are the patterns of questions which are being asked but i think reading from stellen maren and uh, you know uh, cummings are good books uh, which which can give you a overall picture into it and if you want to take a deep reading you know uh, uh, there are uh, even within the stellen maren the paper you know whatever i have brought up it's actually mentioned in stellen maren and as well as in cummings you know where you can go back to the references and see if you are particularly interested you can go back and read individual papers that will give you a lot more you know insight uh, into uh, you know the the concepts behind the neck dissection uh and uh, the other question is okay so the importance of herbs point in spinal accessory nerve dissection so uh, there are there are five important uh, you know landmarks for uh, spinal accessory nerve uh, the most popular and because it's mentioned in the textbooks you know or under our postgraduate textbooks that say probably it's the herbs point and probably a little easier to detect you will uh, know it you know right at the it's so herbs point is used to define the spinal accessory nerve in level 5 so herbs point is at the point wherein it curves around the spinal axis of the sternocleidomastoid muscle so there is a slight discrepancy in the you know description of herbs point in scott brown and stellen maren i and even in jatin shah you know the 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 definition of mrnd is slightly uh, different i i don't know if it's a you know technical error which has happened but you can always go back and read these papers which i had mentioned you know the the academy's classification or jesus medina's paper which will give you you know a lot clearer description of what exactly is you know mrnd 1 2 and 3 and so coming back to the herbs point so herbs point is the point where in the great auricular nerve you know winds around the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid and about 1 cm uh, uh, technically it's about 11 mm is where you would expect you know lower down at that point is where the posterior in the posterior triangle the spinal accessory nerve would run so usually what you would do is at that point you know put in a mosquito and open it up and trace it down and that's when you would usually find the nerve and usually just before you know the nerve appears there would be small leashes of you know venous uh, you know uh, venous um, veins which would be there which would give you a, a you know a rough indication that the nerve is close by the other uh, landmarks which have been described is uh, one is uh, the chaukar's vein so chaukar's vein is in the you know level 2 the level 2 so these are the veins that run from the sternocleidomastoid laterally towards the pharynx so draining into the pharyngeal plexus the uh, the spinal accessory nerve is a few millimeters i think between 3 to 5 millimeters below the the vein so the, again that is another constant landmark apart from this the c2 the transverse process of c2 then uh, uh, the upper one third and lower two third of the spinal axis the sternocleidomastoid muscle is another rough landmark uh, beyond this uh, the the x pointer uh, which is uh, you know the other uh, uh, important landmark which you can look at you know confirming uh, the spinal axis you know now why the x pointer is important is because when you do this neck dissection from level 1 2 3 4 you have cleaved and then you go back to the posterior triangle you know often when you switch from the anterior neck to the posterior neck because there are a lot of nerves that come in you know the 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 cervical rootlets the spinal accessory nerve so you may get confused and you know it will inadvertent injuries are known to occur at that point so probably that's why the x pointer is more relevant then and x pointer is more relevant when you're doing an mr nd and likely that it's going to be of much help when you're doing just a supraumoid neck dissection or a lateral neck dissection uh, no not 11 mm posterior 11 mm superior so above so the great auricular now uh so if if my finger is this uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle and uh, so what runs above this so this is say in case this is the great auricular nerve 
then it's about 11 millimeter posteriorly uh, 11 millimeter superiorly or about a centimeter above is where the spinal accessory nerve would exit into the posterior triangle it's not posterior it is superior to that Okay, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, uh, what is uh, occult primary? Okay, uh, uh, so occult primary or, uh, you know, so uh, there are two terms here. So malignancy of unknown origin. <laughs> And then uh, carcinoma of unknown primary. So uh, what is the difference between the two? So malignancy of unknown origin is when you have a patient, you know that the patient has developed, you know, a neck node or, you know, you are not able to, you are able to identify the metastasis, but you are not able to detect the primary. This is called as malignancy of unknown origin. But when you do an FNA or a core biopsy and you know this is of a carcinoma, so squamous origin, then it becomes carcinoma of unknown primary. Now, occult primary is, you know, when there are different mechanisms which are being proposed to mention a few. So, if say there is a strong immune response and, you know, that has been able to curtail the primary uh, somehow or the primary was there or is at a growing at a very slow pace so that it is not being detected. Secondly, in some HPV related tumors or nasopharyngeal tumors wherein you are known to have large neck nodes, the primary may be very small and gets missed. Uh, Pan, you know, mucosectomies, that is, you know, tongue-based mucosectomy and tonsillar uh, tonsillectomies, you know, have been able to identify, you know, some more cases of, uh, you know, the primary tumor. Now, why is it important to identify the primary tumor? So, uh, it's because you need to understand how MUO is treated. So, if, if it's a large nodal disease, say, if it's an N1 disease, then in that case, the usual treatment is chemo radiation or radiation alone, depending on, you know, the uh, the node and the size of it. Uh, but the moment the nodal burden becomes large, you know, it's a large node, where you know, unlikely that it is going to respond to RT, you look at doing a neck dissection. So that is usually a radical neck dissection followed by RT. Now, if you know where the primary is, uh, you know, arising from, then you don't have to, increase, you know, irradiate the prime, the entire mucosa of the pharynx, nasopharynx and, uh, you know, the laryngopharynx, expecting that the primary tumor could be one in one, hidden in one of these places. So, one, you will be able to prognosticate the patient better and the outcomes are going to be better. So, when occult primary, when you are not able to detect where exactly the primary is coming from, you do something called the panmucosal irradiation. So, wherein, you know, the entire nasopharynx, the oropharynx and uh, laryngopharynx, the part of the laryngopharynx is also irradiated uh, with the, you know, with the therapeutic intent, therapeutic dose of RT is given to these primary sites. Um, so, as I told you, yeah, a neck dissection, ideally in the treatment plan, you know, N2, N3 disease, uh, anywhere is unlikely that it is going to respond alone to RT. You will have, you know, occult disease or residual disease. So, uh, doing a, a, a neck dissection after radiation is definitely a challenge. So, it's always best when you, uh, you know, reduce the disease burden and then subject the patient to radiation, the outcomes are better. So, the moment the patient is N3 kind of a disease, N3B, uh, you know, the, the intent of cure there it becomes very less and your intent more is to, you know, prevent fungation and, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, reduce the pain and other things. So the intent of cure reduces when it becomes an N3 node. So this will be a pathol uh, clinically T0 N1 uh, disease or an N3 disease, sorry. Pathology in CUP, sir. Carcinoma, Davita says adenocarcinoma. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so as I told you, uh, uh, see, uh, for us, you know, this is something uh, which could be a little tricky to answer here. So, the most common, you know, I think is adenocarcinoma itself because the lung primaries, you know, uh, which are uh, likely uh, the, the lung is another important site to, uh, you know, source for uh, uh, MUO. So, MUO at a clinical age. But the moment you do with the advent of PET scan, you know, availability of it, you have been able to pick up uh, the primaries a lot better. 
so if you actually ask probably the true uh, yeah so because head and neck you know uh, uh, stellan maran is a textbook of head and neck probably that's why they have limited themselves to the carcinoma of unknown primary most likely site is going to be head and neck after the pet you have done a pet and you have been able to you know identify uh, the tumor and when i tell you know when, when you know that this is of squamous origin that's when you call it as the uh, carcinoma of unknown primary So, any more questions from the audience? So I think uh, we have taken uh, enough questions here. Uh, we have exceeded the time limit. Uh, so, uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Anand, sir. Uh, we had a really uh, great lecture uh, and a very wonderful uh, interaction between the audience and the speaker. So, uh, I thank all the um, participants who have logged on to our platform. And uh, special thank you for the speaker who has put a lot of energy and uh, has allotted his time for the benefit of the PGs. Thank you, sir. Uh, any more words from you? Thank, thanks, Sir. I think it's a wonderful effort that you guys have. You, I, I think you, have been, you guys have been the most consistent of it. You know, you start this. I think you're the earliest to start this, um, you know, during the last uh, in the first wave and uh, i'm really happy that you guys have continued this you know and have not lost the interest and uh, and i'm still you know happy to see that so many people are actually participating you know uh, what we see is a lot of ent graduates you know uh, fellows they don't have much exposure to head and neck you know that's why probably we are uh, we are not getting the best uh, you know lot of times you know the best and now with a lot of mchc seats coming up i think each one of them you know should be uh, having enough uh, good or uh, sound background of uh, head and neck person before they venture into you know any super specialty course so i think your efforts you know have been uh, you know uh, to bridge the gap where the resources are limited uh, you know uh, asking faculties or people who are uh, you know willing to teach you are, you are going to, you are actually helping a lot of them and i think you know people are benefiting from this you will see the results in the coming years but uh, you know please do continue your efforts this way sir hopefully sir. <clears throat> thank you it, it was really a very uh, long and uh, a very um, fruitful journey and uh, incidentally uh, we have started this program last year on 26th april so in two days we'll be completing one year Mm -hmm. Over the year, we have almost done 200 plus webinars. <laughs> Frankly, I lost the count on so. <laughs> uh, so, so Keep the good work going. So, yeah, with this uh, happy note, uh, I will conclude the webinar. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>